Good morning. Welcome to Grace Lower Stone Church. Where two or three people are gathered in Christ's name, he is present. We dedicate our time together to his glory. Welcome. Come, let us worship together. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody here, especially our visitors. A young man, met a young man this morning, Brian here in the front row. Looks a lot like the Brian sitting up here. Uh, so they're, I think they're interchangeable. Uh, so uh, welcome, and uh, welcome anybody else that might be visiting with us this morning. And of course, uh, all our regular members. Um, are, are there any announcements to be made this morning? Okay. Let's make your way up to the podium so we can get them on tape. Last Sunday, I made an announcement about handbells, and I've had a good response, uh, but we still need a couple more people. We need uh, between 10 and 12. So uh, if you're interested, please see me. Thank you. In the bulletin, if you haven't had a chance to uh, look at it, the Valentine boxes is all ready to be delivered. We're hoping that uh, some of y'all would like to pick up maybe one today and deliver them. They've got the names at the very front, and they look very pretty. Thank you. Uh, many of us had heard that uh, Mayford Carter passed away last Thursday. Um, there is going to be a visitation tonight at uh, Palace Stan Stanton. Staten? Staten. And um, that's going to happen from 6 to 8 this evening. The family will be uh, taking visitors at that time. Also, there will be a funeral tomorrow at 2 p.m. at Faith Lutheran. And uh, as soon as we get a hold of the obituary, we will have that sent out via email. A um, few mother announcements. Um, this Wednesday evening, Ash Wednesday services will be here at 7 p.m. Um, next Sunday morning is Brotherhood, uh, 8.30 a.m. So all our men, please come on out for breakfast. Uh, cook number, crew number two is cooking, I believe. Uh, I think that's Jerry's crew. Okay, thank you. And also next Sunday night is the first Lenten service. Uh, I think they're starting at 5.30 with the recording group, recorder group. Not tape recording, just, yeah, okay. <laughs> I got that. Okay, thank you. The, the recorder group starting at 5.30, then the service will be at 6 p.m. next Sunday evening here at Grace Lower Stone Church. Okay, any other announcements? Um, on behalf of the high school class, for some reason, their classroom has become the storage facility um, for random hodgepodge of stuff, um, Easter baskets, Rowan Museum, decorations, um, all kinds of stuff. So if you're looking for that, it is in that room. Um, and just on behalf of them, please don't use their room as a storage. Um, I kind of went in there today and cleaned it up. There's a ton of empty rooms. If you need some storage room, the some of the elementary school rooms are open um, and please don't take anything from their rooms either. A lot of the stuff that they have in there, um, they've found themselves or they've found a way to get it. Um, so please just keep their room as it is and hopefully we'll get some more in there in the next coming weeks. Thank you. Any other announcements? If not, if you are able, please stand with me for a choral introit, as with, me, as with gladness, men of old, verse 1 and page 290 in the Green Hymnal.
found in your bulletin. Jesus, our Lord, you are the resurrection and the life. We share in your resurrection by serving unto God. Jesus, we are your hands and your feet, commissioned to share the good news. We are your people, called to serve you in all we do. Dear Lord, strengthen us in your spirit, instruct us in your word, and hold us together in your love. We are united in faith, one body, one spirit, one life everlasting. Amen. And please remain standing for our opening hymn, page 444, I Love to Tell the Story.
please remain standing for our invocation. Gracious God who loves and lives through each one, meet us here today as we worship. Teach us in our time together to accept one another as you have accepted each one already. Let your church be the vessel of healing and wholeness, and compassion and encouragement and strength and comfort. Have mercy on your church that we might be with one voice, give glory and praise to you. Amen. And with that commitment, let's share together our common beliefs by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. God has welcomed us. Let us extend God's blessings by sharing our tithes and offerings in support of Christ's ministry today. If our ushers would come forward.
God of grace, it is our delight and our devotion to give these gifts to you. All we are and all we have are yours alone. Accept this joyful offering as a token of our abiding love and use it to bring peace, justice, and comfort to all of our world. Amen. If our young folks will come forward, Pastor Jay will have the children's message. Where'd everybody go today? Guess it must be raining, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Good morning. Try it again. Good morning. That's better. I like that. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been hungry? You have. Guess what? I'm getting ready to change your mind. What do you like to eat more than anything else in the world? What's your favorite food? Pizza. Mine, too. <laughs> what do you like, Christian? Everything? <laughs> Grandma says everything. No, watch out. He's going to get bigger. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, David Maxwell was talking to the uh, men's group last time we met about his uh, trip to Rwanda. And David said something that started me thinking, and that could be dangerous. But I'll tell you, what he, what he was talking about was the what 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 he did over there and some of the things that he did our church helped out in our church helped out with giving bibles to the people over there and we we helped out with the kids going to school all the kids in that school are going to be going to school this year because of us it costs them to go to school they don't have a, a free public education like we do in america they, uh, they, they have to pay to go to school. They have to pay $10 a year to go to school. And there's 120 kids over there, and all of them are going to go to school this year because of us. And isn't that nice? Isn't that neat to know? But I'll tell you something. Something David said to me really grabbed my heart. And he said that a lot of those kids don't have enough to eat. They have a glass of milk and a piece of bread. What if you had a glass of milk and a piece of bread? What would you do, Christian? You did, would you be hungry afterwards? You would be, wouldn't you? What about you, Rayla? Would you be hungry after that? Well, guess what? There are millions and millions and millions of children all over the world some of them here in the United States, the most affluent country in the world. And there are, there are some right here in Rowan and Cabarrus counties that don't have enough to eat. And they eat bread and drink milk, and that's about all they have. And some of them don't even have that much. So, I'll tell you, uh, today I'm going to give you something that I want you to do. You may not do it today, but sometime I want you to think about it. I'm going to give you a piece of bread. All wrapped up so it's nice and, nice and soft. But you'll have to eat it for long, for it won't be soft forever. <laughs> All right. And I want you to go home. You could do it today at lunchtime. And take a glass of milk and eat that piece of bread. And think that maybe that's all some kids are getting to eat all day long today. And think how hungry you're really going to feel. You don't like it? <laughs> you like chocolate? Go drink chocolate milk. That'll be all right. You like chocolate milk? Okay, drink you some chocolate milk. If you go to, if you go to, uh, to uh, some of the grocery stores right now, it's a dollar thirty-six in a, a gallon. So, but at any rate, uh, what I want you to do, I want you to, to to think when you eat that, 
that that's all some children are, are getting to eat all day long. And you're going to get it for one meal. Okay? All right. So now I want to ask you, what can we do about that? What can we do to help children get something to eat? Give them what? Money. We can give them money. You know what we do? You know how we do that? We send it through our missionaries. Our missionaries help them with that. We also could give them food. And we could also teach them how to raise their own food. You know, there's an old saying that I remember back when I was a little boy. Give a man a fish and he can eat for a day. Teach him how to fish and eat the rest of his life. So, you know, we can we can do a lot of things like that. What can we do here in Rowan County? We have Rowan Helping Ministries. We have, we can give, uh, we can go work at Rowan Helping Ministries. We can give food, stuff like that. You know, folks, we can preach all we want to people. Listen to me, folks. But if they have empty bellies, it's going to be awful hard for them to listen. So, you know, let's let's share the Word of God with them. But let's, let's show the Word to them by giving them something to eat, to fill their empty bellies. Okay? All right. Now, when you eat those today, you remember about all those millions of children all over the world. They're eating that. That's all they have today. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Oh, God, we thank you that we have so much to eat and so much to share. Help us, oh God, to share it in every way we can so that people will know that we are God's people, that we are your people to share your word and your love with them through, through food to eat. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, and then thank you, Rosa and Trinity, for having Children's Church. Let's take a moment to center ourselves in Christ and let's take a moment to come together and share the things that are on our hearts and the things that we're standing in need of prayer for. What are some of the prayer concerns and praise reports that we have this week? Certainly continued prayers for the family of Mayford Carty and all those folks and continued prayers for the family of, of Bertha Miller as they continue to, to grieve. I heard about that. Kevin Gillum, his, his uh, mother passed away. Yeah. Brian, I have a gentleman that I do caregiving for on Wednesdays and Sunday afternoons that uh, he's almost 98 years old. He's going to have heart surgery Okay. on Thursday. But folks, you won't see me Thursday. I'll be with him. Okay. But, uh, but please remember, send in our prayers. Okay. And we will see you Wednesday for Ash Wednesday, however. Tommy. What are some of the other concerns on our hearts? What are the names of the folks that we're praying for today? Edith Moose, her yeah. brother I heard about that as well. Edith Moose, her, her brother passed. Yeah. So let's uh, let's lay these petitions down, and let's um, uh, let's take a, a minute to just close our eyes and let's connect with God. As we breathe in and breathe out, with each breath in, let's just deepen our awareness of God's spirit as it fills our hearts. God's spirit, God's very breath is filling our lungs right now. As we breathe out, let's breathe out all of the things that we're worried about, all the things that, um, that concern us, all the things that keep us from fully being here. God, we lay before you the, the needs of this community, the people that are hurting, the people that need care. And God, we, we lay before you the needs of, of, of those around us, for everyone who's hungry, 
God, we ask that you, you provide. We thank you for the provision that you do provide. God, as we turn on the TV, we see that this is a very unsettled world, and there's places that are, are embroiled in battles and war. And God, we ask that um, you come in and do what you do. God, it's likely that we'll make a mess of this world. We need you to straighten us out sometimes. And God, we just ask that, um, that you bring peace to our world, that you bring justice to this world. God, we ask that you bring peace to our, to our hearts, bring peace to our families, bring peace to our community, peace to our nation, peace to our world. God, we come before you today and we, we, we pray to you as our Father, the way that Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's please rise and sing our hymn of worship. You may be seated. God, be with. 
with us, open our hearts as we lift up your word. Let your word show in our lives and show in all that we do. Amen. Our reading today is from 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. <coughs> Indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would make it that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas more respectable members do not need this. But God so arranged the body, giving greater honor to the inferior member. That there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. My sermon today is titled Ecclesiastical Mitosis. And I was joking downstairs. I said, I hope that this is not a $10 title for a $2 sermon. Um, and I am going to risk, risk sounding like a high school science teacher today, but bear with me because I, I, th I think it's helpful in understanding the body of Christ to look at the human body a little bit. The word ecclesiastical means church, and mitosis is the process in which cells grow and divide and become more cells. So in our scripture today, the Apostle Paul, he compares the Christian faith to a human body, all with several different parts, all serving to function as the body of Christ on earth. We are the body of Christ. Now this is a powerful metaphor, and it inspires me when I think about being part of Jesus' work here on earth, and in a way, I contribute to the resurrection of Jesus by being the literal, physical body of Christ. That should motivate all of us to know that we're, we are part of him. You know, to deepen our understanding of what it means to be the body of Christ and how we got here, 
I think, and, and how we proceed from here too, I think it's helpful to look at the human body and, and how it grows and how it develops and how we might be able to apply that understanding to the body of Christ. Now, a human body, it starts, the, the, we're, we're going to do a little review here. A human body starts with two cells. We've got a mom cell and a dad cell. They come together. They, they form what's called a zygote. Now, this is, it starts off with one cell, and there's, there's chromosomes from one cell, and there's chromosomes from the other cell, and they come together, and they form their own combined DNA. And it starts there. Now, once a zygote is formed, it's going to break off, and there's going to be two more cells, and those two are going to have that same common combined DNA, and then from there, it's going to continue to grow. The growth of these cells is a process that's called mitosis. It starts with, you've got the nucleus of a cell, right? Everybody still with me? All right, we've got the nucleus of a cell, and we have the DNA within the cell. It starts with those chromosomes replicating th themselves. They become, there's two, and then there's four of those chromosomes. And once they do that within the nucleus, the nucleus breaks away. And it's still in the same cell, and that cell is held together by a membrane, and that membrane is it's strong enough to hold that cell together, but it's permeable enough to allow organic matter and, and ions to, to move in and out of that cell, and it holds it together until the, the, the two nuclei start pulling away from each other, and it gets bigger and bigger until finally it gets to the point where it splits down the middle, and then it, you have two cells. And then the same thing happens again, then you have four cells, then you have eight cells, then 16, then 32, then 64, then 128. That's as far as I'm going. I'm not going to try to do math in my head right now. 256. All right, good. We've got some mathematicians going in here. All right. You get my point. This is, this is how the body grows. These cells, they go off and do other things. Some of these cells go off to form eyeballs. Some of them go off to form pinky toes. But they all share that same core DNA, that same genetic code, wherever they go. So when I think about how the human body develops, I can see some similarities with the body of Christ and how the body of Christ formed here on earth. You know, it started small. It started with, first with the disciples being around Jesus. They had their own little nucleus. They had their own cell. And they started going around and they started telling the gospel firsthand. And the Christian church started growing all over the place. They went around sharing that gospel, growing and multiplying. Eventually, we see the Christian faith spread to the, all through the Middle East, through Europe and Asia and Africa. We see Paul writing letters to churches in Ephesus and Corinth and Galatia and Rome and Colossae and Thessalonica and Philippi. Paul's letters covered the breadth of the entire Mediterranean Sea. And it kept growing. The church kept growing, all carrying the same DNA, which is the gospel. Eventually, there was a great schism, and we have Eastern and Western versions of Christianity that go off and do their own thing. Each would develop, all still sharing that same initial DNA. Eventually, the church would grow to the point where Reformation happened, and we, we started seeing all these denominations forming from what was the Catholic Church. We see Anglicans and Lutherans and Methodists and Moravians and Presbyterians and Baptists and so on and so forth. If I didn't name your favorite, I'm sorry. Um, all are connected by the same DNA, which is the gospel. All being connected by that same DNA, we all stand as part of the body of Christ. Now, let's be honest. Every now and then, we like to maybe say, well, at least I'm not Moravian. Or I might say, well, at least I'm not Catholic. Or at least I'm not Baptist. And sometimes we like to place ourselves above, above other people who also share the same Christian DNA. I do it. I'm very guilty of it. I do, I, I do it more than I should. If we're being honest, it's not uncommon for us to create, at least in our minds, maybe we don't say it, we create pecking orders on the different types of Christians that there are. But when we look at what Paul is doing today, Paul is trying to use this metaphor to keep the people in Corinth and all the folks that are going to read this letter. He knew that his letters had or, or were going to have a wide readership. He was trying to keep them from establishing pecking orders amongst themselves. He didn't want the church to become so centered on the priests and the clergy. He wanted everybody to know that you're sharing this part. Everybody's doing the same thing, and everybody's honored in the same way. He wanted to, he wanted to challenge not only the pecking orders within 
Corinth, but he wanted the church in Corinth to not say, well, at least we're not the Ephesians, and didn't want the Ephesians to say, well, at least we're not the Galatians. He wanted to, to establish that we're all part of the body of Christ, working together, we're dependent on each other, and there's no superior or inferior parts, we're all on the same team. That's what he was trying to do. And in doing so, Paul was doing something that Jesus did several times. How many times in the Gospels do we center on the disciples and they're trying to figure out who is the best among them? Uh, if, we, if, if we've heard the gospel preach, we know that the, the disciples like to do that. They, they like to figure out, well, who gets to sit next to Jesus? Which one of us is the best? And what does Jesus always say to them? The last shall be first, the first shall be last. He, he, Jesus tells them, don't establish these pecking orders. They're not useful. We're all the same. And Paul is doing the same thing. He's keeping that tradition going. Paul's a really good pastor, and he's building up his congregation in Corinth. He's trying to remind the believers in, in, in Corinth that they matter, that the work they do matters, regardless of the, if their work is high profile or not. You know, Paul uses the imagery of the human body and points out that every part of the body matters and is important to the function of the body as a whole. Now, here's a part, that, uh, a part about me. When I was younger, when I, I guess when I was around my son's age, I was one of those snarky Christians that tried to poke holes in everything, you know, and I, and I remember saying things like, reading this scripture and saying, oh, well, clearly the gallbladder is not as important as the heart, you know, and I would say things like, uh, you can have damage to your gallbladder, and, and you can even replace your gallbladder, you can have it removed, and you'll be fine, but, you know, if your heart, you take your heart out, you'll die instantly, you know, and, and, I, and I would go on and on about that, and I would be this snarky kid trying to try out my faith for the first time, you know, to see, see how that played. And often we do that. You know, we, we're like, well, you know, my pinky toe is not as important as maybe my pointer finger and those kind of things. But that's exactly what Paul was trying to address, was that there, that there are no parts that matter anymore. We're all part of the same team. We all have to encourage each other. We all have to be part of the same thing. We all share that. And as that snarky kid, you know, that's before I went to seminary. And in seminary, I learned that when, when uh, Paul was saying the word body, he used the word soma. And the word soma in, um, in Greek, was, it, it, means, it means the body. And, and in ancient Greek philosophy, which Paul was very steeped in, Paul's a very smart guy. He, he, was, he was trained in, in rabbinical training. He was trained in legal training. And then he also uh, was trained as a philosopher. And he comes from that, that, that Greco-Roman tradition that looked at a person as being made up of two parts, a body and a soul. And just as a soul is a whole thing, he was saying the body is a whole thing as well. So it doesn't make sense to look at individual parts of a body. You wouldn't look at individual parts of a soul, and he was saying it, it, it's of, of the same stuff. So when he says soma, he means the whole body. You know, when we look at what a person was, then it doesn't matter if they're missing a gallbladder or they don't have a pinky toe. They're looking at a, a body, a whole body, just as we are the whole body of Christ. You know, and... A little side note on the gallbladder, you know, uh, as I learn more and more about the gallbladder, the gallbladder, sometimes we have problems with our gallbladders because it's indicating a bigger problem. It, that means that there's something else is going on that needs to be addressed. And uh, our gallbladders are like a canary in a coal mine, you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes it warns us of, of bigger issues. If our body was made up of a bunch of soldiers, the gallbladder is that soldier that jumps on a grenade to save his platoon. The gallbladder's a hero, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and as I, as, I, as I get older, you know, I look back at the earlier versions of myself, and I, and I have to laugh, you know, and we all do that. As, it's called wisdom, and, and as I get older, and as I learn more and more, I laugh at some of the things that I used to think. That was certainly one of them. You know, the, the, the parts of the human, human body, they, they function together like a team. You know, and, and speaking of teams, there was, a, there was a really boring Super Bowl that happened last Sunday. The not Panthers played the not Giants, and I could care less. But um, I'm a giant. I'm a Giants fan. I, I sh probably shouldn't say that from the pulpit. I'm also I'm also a Panthers fan, and you can apologize for that too. Um, but uh, the Super Bowl was last Sunday, and it really was a good game. It was a good game, and I looked up from my computer every now and then to watch it. Um, but you know, 
on every team, there's different players, and they all have different responsibilities, sort of like a human body. You know, the MVPs are always going to be, in football, the MVPs are always going to be quarterbacks. They're always going to be running backs. Maybe a defensive end is going to make a few plays. If somebody gets like three interceptions, they're going to be the MVP. But you're never going to see the role players getting MVPs. You're never going to see people on special teams or the, the folks with the thankless task of being an offensive lineman. Jay, were you an offensive lineman? Yeah. You were a defensive back. You were a fullback. All right, so, so you might have been an MVP. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Um, but, you know, placeholders, and, um, and teams have a, a position called the long snapper. Long snapper is never going to be the MVP of the Super Bowl or of the league. You know, um, the only time, I want to talk about this long snapper for just a second. Uh, uh, in football, there's a position called a long snapper. The long snapper has one job one job. All they do is hike the ball to the punter. That's it. That's all they do. They, they hike the ball to the punter, and then they block and try to keep the defensive folks from trying to get to the punter. Now, the only way to be noticed as a long snapper, the only way that anyone's going to pay any attention to you is if you're off sides, if you get called for a holding penalty, or if you mess up and hike the ball incorrectly and cause a turnover. That's the only way to get noticed as a long snapper. You could do your, do your job to complete perfection. You can hike the ball perfectly every time. Was it 30 feet to the punter? You could do it perfectly every time and hold the defense at bay every time perfectly, and no one is ever going to notice. You could average 50 yards a punt, and who's going to get the credit? The punter. The punter is going to get the credit. No one is ever going to pay attention to the long snapper. It's a thankless job. That being said, I think me and maybe my son are the only two people who know the name Zach Diossi. Does anybody know who Zach Diossi is? Brian and I are Giants fans. Brian doesn't even know who Zach Diossi is. <laughs> he, he plays, he plays for, the, for the New York Giants, and he's been their long snapper for 10 years. You have to be a, a ridiculous fan like me to know who your long snapper is, right? But um, he's, he's a veteran for 10 years with the Giants. He has two Super Bowl rings. And the thing about him is that as a veteran, he helps the other players get acclimated to the culture of being a professional. He's a man of integrity. He, he leads other players in serving in his community. You know, if you want to be friends with Zach Diossi, you have to put in your work. You need to show up early and stay late. You have to, you have to work hard and put the team first. He helps lift up the collective character of the team. You know, Zach, like all the other Giants, when they put on that uniform, they all share that same DNA and are all working towards the same goal. Just like we as the body of Christ. You know, for them, like any other team, success comes from working together. Likewise, the body of Christ is most effective when we work together. It's kind of, kind of like, all right, I'm going to use a, a reference here that some of us will get and some of us won't. It's kind of like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Who's with me? Who's, who's still with me when I say Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Okay. It, uh, uh, certainly my son knew who the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers are. I'll, I'll explain briefly. The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers are a group of adolescents that all have martial arts abilities, and, um, and they fight evil, and when things are really bad, they all join together and form a big thing called the Megazord right? So there's a red one, there's a green one, there's a blue one, a yellow one, a black one. Is that everybody? Uh, that's enough. <laughs> a pink one, the pink one. I can't forget the pink one. You know, they all have their own strengths and abilities, and individually, they have their own things that they do. Some are, are a little bit more brainy, some are a little stronger, some are faster. And, um, but when there's a huge problem, let's say there's a giant lizard monster the size of a Chrysler building. If that happens, that's when they all come together and they form this Megazord. Am I saying it right? Is it a Megazord, Brian? Okay. All right. And, and some of them form the hands, some of them form the feet, some of them form the, the torso, and a sword appears from somewhere. And, um, and then they go and fight this huge, huge evil problem together. They have to, because as, as the individuals, they don't stand a chance. What are the big 
giant lizard monster problems facing our world right now. Jade mentioned hunger. Hunger is one of those giant lizard monster problems. You know, uh, right now, as I turn on the news, I see that there, there's, there's unrest in the Middle East, you know, and that, that continues to escalate. You know, um, there, there's terrorism when, when, when we look around. To deal with these issues, the body of Christ has to come together to form a huge, cooperative, focused version of itself in order to effectively combat the evils in our world. Together, we stand a chance of making a difference. So, you know, I want to I wanna go back to that cell, that image of the human cell going through the process of mitosis and growing. You know, each, each cell in the human body, it, it, it has an outer membrane. The cell walls, they have to be firm enough to hold that cell together. But they have to be permeable enough to allow in what it needs. Grace Lower Stone, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that holds us together? What is our cell membrane? I don't think it's these walls that have been here for so long. I don't think it's just these physical walls that hold us together. Jay says it's Christ and it's our faith in Jesus that holds us together. It's our common creed. That's, that's what's strong. That's what holds us together. Wind could blow down this beautiful, beautiful building. An earthquake could shake it to the ground, but that would never affect the faith that really holds us together. Our faith needs to be strong enough to hold us together, but permeable enough to allow in the things we need to grow and thrive. You see how that works? That's what a healthy cell looks like. That's what a healthy church looks like. Strong in its faith, committed and connected in its purpose, and steadfast in its commitment to grow. Grace Lower Stone, brothers and sisters, we are in this together. We are all on the same team. As followers of Christ, we all share the same DNA. Our community needs us. Our world needs us. We need us. Amen. Please let us stand for the closing hymn, page 405 in the green hymnal. I love thy kingdom, Lord.
May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.